it's not men's football, it's not women's football, it's just football. Let me take you back to the 5th of December, 2021. I was standing pitch side at the home of football under the famous Wembley Arch with my microphone in one hand, my team sheet and my hand warmer in the other. It was the Vitality Women's FA Cup final between Arsenal and Chelsea. A freezing cold day in the capital and the rain persisted to thrash down on the nearly 41,000 fans in attendance. But there was no spirit being dampened that day. I remember looking out into the crowd and feeling so hopeful for the future because there were thousands of young girls and women being visibly inspired by what they were witnessing. Now it was Chelsea that went on to lift the trophy and complete the domestic treble. But it was a triumphant day for all involved in women's football. A day for celebration, a day for reflection. Because not only was it the 50th anniversary of the Women's FA Cup, but it was also exactly 100 years to the day that women were banned from playing on FA-affiliated pitches. They were told it was quite unsuitable for females and ought not to be encouraged. Now, that ban lasted until 1971. So, where do I fit into all of this? Well, I am a woman in football. I am a presenter, stadium announcer, and event host. But the beautiful game was a huge part of my life long before I was ever able to call it work. Now, my dad was a professional football player, so he played for Southampton Football Club for 20 years. So I have so many amazing memories of going along to the Dell and St. Mary's, as you can see behind me, to support him and cheer him on with the rest of the family. Now, I also used to play football. I played for a local Southampton team, and I'd spend hours in the garden playing football with my brother, our friends, and dad as well, of course. I also spent countless school holidays on various summer football camps, where more often than not, myself and one other girl called Laura Rafferty were the only girls. And it's great to see that Laura has now gone on to become a professional footballer herself. She plays for Southampton Football Club and also represents Northern Ireland. Safe to say her playing career worked out a little bit better than mine did. Now, although I no longer play football, and I haven't done for many, many years, and I really did love every second I spent playing football, I'm incredibly proud to be involved in the sport in a different capacity. Now, given that growing up, football was very much always at the core of everything, it was always so normal for me to both play and to watch the sport, because I grew up in a household where it wasn't just men's football. It wasn't just women's football. It was just football. I was used to seeing my dad in the public eye, being on camera, conducting interviews. And so that media world was always really interesting to me. And listen, I loved to talk. So I knew that a career in presenting was the one for me. Anyone that knows me will tell you that I love to chat. So that was always where I wanted to end up. So, as I got older, I thought, how do I put this idea of wanting to become a presenter into action somehow? Well, I started working at Sky Sports when I was at school, unpaid initially as a runner on Soccer Saturday and Goals on Sunday. But you know what? Even though I was just making teas and coffees, it was the best thing ever. I was at Sky Sports. I felt like it was the first rung on the ladder for me. I was seeing how everything worked both on and off camera. And I have to confess, on every tea run, en route to the cafe, I did go via the Sky Sports News studios and just catch a glimpse of the likes of Hayley McQueen and Kirsty Gallagher. That was where I wanted to be. It was so inspiring. I was completely mesmerized. I then went on to work in the gallery, 
And this was fantastic because one of my jobs included taking the phones from the reporters around the grounds on Soccer Saturday, but I used to operate the autocue as well. This was the first opportunity I'd had to read an autocue. Although it was the presenter really reading it, I took this opportunity to practice in the hope that one day I'd be the one sat in the hot seat reading the autocue. I then became aware that I was going to need to start gaining experience on camera. So I started reaching out to local charities and local businesses in the hope that someone would take a chance on me. And an opportunity did arise to cover a couple of matches at Eastleigh Football Club as the stadium announcer. I was only 17 at the time. I was so nervous, but I leapt at the opportunity and I loved every second. It was incredible. Now from there, I went on to go to university. I got a first class honours degree in multimedia journalism. And it was during this time that I really, really wanted to home in on my skills as a presenter. For the first time, I had all this equipment to my disposal. So I'd stay late after every lecture, practice pieces to camera, use the auto cue for once I was the one reading it. And it was just so exciting to me. I just wanted to become the best that I could be. I then started reaching out to producers and agents, saying, please take a chance on me. But nothing really ever came to fruition. The answer was always the same. You don't have any experience. Right, I need to change this. So I hired some camera equipment, and I dragged my poor brother around Southampton with me, and I got him to film me talking about everything and anything. And I created a showreel. So I had something that I could send off to people to say, look, this is what I can do. And it was during this time, when I was 19, that I landed the role as the stadium announcer and pitch side presenter at Southampton Football Club. Now I have to say, presenting in front of 32,000 people every weekend was a bit of a contrast to the Kenzie Benali show that I had subjected my family to for so many years at home. Now, this would be when I would run around the house with my hairbrush, which later turned in to my crystal-studded microphone, which I think my parents quickly regretted gifting me. But there's nothing like the buzz of live broadcasting. It was incredible to finally be doing the job I dreamed for so long about. And from there, work started to trickle in more and more. I started working at venues like the Copper Box Arena, Wembley Stadium, the home of football, and I also went on to work in TV. I landed my first TV role when I was 21. It was a short feature on Nickelodeon on a show at the time called Nick Kicks. And once again, I just loved every second of the experience. Now that kind of trickled on and I went on to regularly present on CBBC's Match of the Day Kickabout. I was regularly presenting on a show that I had loved watching so much as a child. I was fortunate enough to be working with and interviewing some of the biggest stars in world football and traveling around the globe at the same time as well. And not only that, I was also working alongside presenters that I had watched as a child. That's Sam and Mark for anyone who might recognize them. It was incredible and I was loving every second. Now, I also work on The 100, the brand new cricket competition. It was an incredible success last summer, and I'm really looking forward to working on it again this year. And The 100 was fantastic because it really, really promoted women's cricket. The men and women played in the same stadiums on the same day. And it was just wonderful to see a brand new generation of budding cricketers. Now, I'm still very much on my journey. There is still so much that I'd like to achieve in my career. But that being said, I wanted to take this opportunity while I'm with you today to share a few actionable insights that I think we can all use to reach the top of our game. So my first tip, choose your team wisely. Your support network is so key. My family and friends have supported me 110%. They've believed in me in days when I didn't believe in myself. 
They were there to pick me up through the disappointment of all the rejections. Now, motivational speaker Jim Ron suggested that we are the average of the five people we spend the most time with. So, ask yourself the question, does your closest circle empower you, support you, and make you want to be the best version of yourself possible? And finally, your approach to failure is key. Now, nobody reaches the top of their game without failing at some stage. It's impossible to be truly successful without encountering some form of failure along the way. I've been to so many auditions that just haven't materialized. It's important that whatever field we're in, we learn to take it on the chin, dust ourselves off, and go again. Now, I bumped into Piers Morgan many years ago at St. Mary's Stadium. I know he's somewhat of a divisive character, but he did give me some really, really useful advice. He quoted Winston Churchill, success consists of going from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm. So stay resilient. Don't let failure knock you down. And third and finally, perhaps an obvious one, but do what you love. I don't believe that you can be truly successful if you're not utterly passionate about what it is you're doing. So a few actionable insights there and a brief overview of my career so far. And as you've been hearing, my pathway into football was a pretty natural one. But for so many others, that unfortunately just isn't the same. Because young girls and women for so long were told that football was just a game for the boys. So why is this? Well, let me take you back to the First World War. When men were being sent off to fight for their countries, women stepped up to fill the void in factories up and down the country. Now, more or less every single one of these factories created a ladies' football team. The most famous of them, though, was in Preston, the Dick Kerr ladies. Now, they would regularly host football matches to raise vital funds for wounded soldiers and bereaved families. And they were regularly attracting fans in their thousands. Even after the war, though, the women's game continued to flourish. On Boxing Day in 1920, 53,000 fans packed into Everton's Goodison Park to watch the Dick Kerr ladies take on St. Helen ladies with a further 14,000 spectators said to be stuck outside, unable to get in. Incredible. And yet, the FA brought in the ban on women's football the following year. For 50 long years, women were not able to play football. Think about that for a moment. Can you imagine telling your daughter, your wife, your sister, your best friend, that they can't play the game they truly love. Had men's football suffered the same fate, there would be no George Best. There'd be no Bobby Moore. And of course, we would have never lifted the World Cup in 1966. Where would the women's game be now had that ban not been imposed? Well, sadly, we'll never know. But that being said, there is still an incredible appetite for women playing, watching, and working in football over the last half century. And I am so proud to have been a tiny part of the upward trajectory in the women's game. Now, let me take you back to June 2019. I flew out to France to cover the Women's World Cup. And what an extraordinary spectacle that was. As you can see here, 11.7 million people tuned in to watch England's semi-final defeat to the United States. No, we might not have won, but it really was a special, special moment in history. However, that being said, there is still the fact that women's football is still very much in a growth phase. And that's reflected in things like prize funds. So it was actually the United States women that went on to win the Women's World Cup. Their prize fund? 
3.2 million pounds. That sounds pretty nice, right? Well, let's compare that to the French team that won the Men's World Cup the year prior. Their prize fund, 29 million pounds. So that's just a little insight into the work that still needs to be done. But that being said, let's keep things positive. There is still so much to be celebrated. And this was another such day. I was proud to be presenting pitch side for Lionesses versus Germany, when an incredible, just under 78,000 people packed into Wembley to watch England. Now this became the largest crowd to watch a British women's international on home soil. And I'm so pleased to say that we're seeing attendances like this regularly now. Only last week, nearly 92,000 fans packed into Camp Nou to watch Barcelona women take on Real Madrid women. Just extraordinary. The future looks so bright. And of course, we have the Euros happening this summer, and that's set to be the biggest and most exciting competition so far to date. It is now a realistic ambition for young girls and women to be a footballer, to work in football, because it's not just men's football. It's not just women's football. It's just football. So I'd like to leave you with this quote from poet Rupi Kerr. I stand on the sacrifices of a million women before me, thinking what can I do to make this mountain taller so that women after me can see further. I want you all to ask yourself, what are you doing to make this mountain taller? We all have a part to play here. Men, women, boys, girls. It's so important. There is a place for you in football. Whether you want to play, referee, coach, present, or just watch for the enjoyment. Because remember, it's not men's football, it's not women's football, it's just football. And given that the theme of the day is putting ideas into action, I'd also like to leave you with this thought. To me, an idea without action is really just a dream. So take your idea, whatever that may be, put it into action and make your dream a reality. Thank you.